so that's why our print is different. So our print no longer covers option two, because option two is now available in a different form, which is the supplemental health benefits. But because the old option two was early retirement... I have not a clue what we're talking about. I'm calling to order this uh, hearing. This is a public hearing of the Committee of the Whole. I'm Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council and Chair of the Committee of the Whole. Today is Friday, April 26, 2013. The time is 12.43 in the morning in the afternoon. Let me start over. The time is 12.43 in the afternoon. We are in room 120 of the Johnny Wilson Building. The subject of this afternoon's hearing is Bill 20-64. Bill 20-64 is entitled the Teachers Retirement Amendment Act of 2014. This legislation was introduced by me and Council Members Kenyon McDuffie and Marion Berry on Tuesday, January 8, 2013. The stated purpose of this bill is to amend the district code to provide for early retirement without penalty for teachers separated from service under the District of Columbia Public Schools performance-based accessing policy and to provide for the administration of certain awards. That's the statement of the bill as it was introduced. We've been working on a committee print and we've tried to make that print available to the public and the um, committee print is slightly different. Let's see, the long title says to amend an act for the retirement of public school teachers in the District of Columbia to allow for involuntary retirement for an excess permanent status teachers whose most recent performance evaluation score was effective or higher. The impetus for this legislation is the fact that with um, the recent trends with the DC public school system, the number of schools and the number of students, that there are teachers who are leaving not because they uh, want to, and um, the um, Depending upon their status, the issue is whether they should be allowed access to the retirement system. That's essentially the concept behind the legislation that about which this hearing is today. Now, the record in this matter will close. Just a moment. I'm hesitating because the hearing notice says the record will close at 5 p.m. on Friday, May 10th. But we're planning on marking up this bill next Tuesday, April 30th, and the bill will be presented for first reading to the council on May 7th. So individuals who wish to submit comments that are not doing so today or who wish to supplement their comments from today uh, should get them to us by 5 p.m. 
on Monday so that we're able to consider them uh, before the markup on Tuesday, April 30th. That's our current schedule with this legislation. Uh, we have a number of witnesses. Um, we usually have uh, government officials testifying at the end of the hearing. We have three seats, so I'm going to ask three people to come up if they're here. Nathan Saunders, I didn't see him, uh, from the uh, Teachers Union, uh, Taylor Lewis, if you'd come forward, uh, Eric Martell, I see him in the audience, and Mary Collins, if she's here, if she'd come forward. Ms. Lewis, you're with the Teachers Union, correct? Yes. Is Mr. Saunders going to be here? Yes, he's on the video. Okay, well, we'll start with you, and if he gets here, we will hear his testimony. Please. And do we have, if you have written statements, do we have copies? Yes, sir. Okay. Why don't we begin with you, Ms. Lewis? Good afternoon, Chairman Edelson. My name is Ted Lewis, Field Services Specialist for the Washington Teachers Union. I work directly with members in matters related to their appointment with the District of Columbia Public Schools, including retirement and accessing. I'm here to testify in support of the Teachers Retirement Amendment Act of 2013. This legislation will ensure that excess permanent status teachers whose most recent evaluation scores are effective or higher are able to utilize involuntary retirement when they, when they are unable to find a permanent position. Currently, the involuntary retirement provision of the teacher's retirement plan, which is subsection 38 of the District of Columbia official code, includes involuntary separation as a prerequisite for involuntary retirement. Excess teachers whose most recent evaluation scores are less than effective meet this threshold because they are separated by District of Columbia Public Schools when they are unable to secure a permanent position during the 60-day window following the effective date of accessing. However, teachers whose most recent evaluation scores are effective or higher are not separated by DCPS when they are unable to secure a permanent position during that time frame because of the existence of options under section 4.5.5.3 of the collective bargaining agreement between WTU and DCPS. There are three options listed in this section of our CBA. However, only two have actually been made available to teachers. Option one, a $25,000 pre-tax buyout, and option three, one year additional year placement in DCPS with full salary and benefits. WTU has recently renegotiated another option that consists of a DCPS funded temporary benefits package. Excess permanent status teachers whose most recent evaluation scores are effective or higher are able to select one of these options if they are unable to secure a permanent position. Because option three allows a teacher to choose an additional year of continued employment with DCPS, separation that results from the choice to forego this option is not involuntary. It is a result of the teacher's choice. The Teachers Retirement Amendment Act of 2013 seeks to amend the involuntary re retirement provision, subsection 38-2021.03b, by explicitly including excess permanent status teachers who are unable to find permanent placement and whose most recent evaluation score is effective or higher in the classification of involuntary separations for the sole purpose of determining eligibility of involuntary retirement. This legislation should not be construed to require DCPS to separate excess permanent status teachers who are effective or higher when they are unable to find permanent placement. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have about my testimony. Thank you for your attention to this, to this important issue. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Um, Mr. Martell? Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Chairman Mendelson. Uh, my name is Eric Martell, retired DCPS high school social studies teacher and former member of the Washington Teachers Union Executive Board and for a few months on the uh, negotiating team for the current contract. Uh, the proposed amendment seeks to expand the term involuntarily separated to include excess of, permanent, excess of a permanent status teacher. But is that necessary? The current wording of 382103B is sufficiently comprehensive. It begins any teacher who is voluntar involuntarily separated. An excess permanent status teacher is already fully included in the implicit definition uh, any teacher who is involuntarily separated. 
Um, page two, line three of the revised proposal, um, lowercase Roman numeral two, introduces a narrowing definition that does not exist in the current statute, retirement statute. Quote, a teacher whose most recent evaluation score was effective or higher, unquote, thereby conferring through the back door, as it were, de facto statutory legitimacy on impact. But teachers with high, effective or higher evaluation scores already are included, as are teachers with less than effective evaluation scores, and that's part of the problem for DCPS. DCPS has its paper bag test, impact, but it overlooked a loophole. Teachers who chose option three, the extra year, and who happened to meet the criteria for option two after a year of being rejected, if they are not placed at the end of that year, um, are still eligible under the wording for uh, early retirement. The WTU and DCPS recently announced a new option to VEBA plan. But there's a, there's a problem. It changes a provision of the negotiated agreement that was voted on by the members. The president and the chancellor, president of the union and the chancellor, do not have legal authority to arbitrarily change a provision of the agreement, uh, but they do want your Le the legitimacy on that action conferred by statutory inclusion of these actions. Um, you see, the problem is that many teachers have been denied the right to choose an option uh, and it, because it has been sort of turned in, uh, the option, if you read the wording in the contract, it lays out the options. But there are all kinds of obstacles. People have to submit huge packets of information to the union president. They don't hear back. Um, what the world chancellor has in that, it's, it's unclear. Um, the chancellor follows contractual deadlines for accessing and termination to the day, but lets due process challenges fester for weeks, months, and years. But I want you to consider the full meaning of what you're being asked to do. Mary Levy has documented the large number of teachers who, by the two chancellors' own impact criteria, were rated effective or highly effective, but accessed and replaced by untested and inexperienced new recruits. We were promised great student gains if so-called mutual consent could be imposed, but the results are stagnant. Finally, we're not talking about seniority or bumping rights. They were lost a long time ago but the right of students and parents to know that a vacancy will be filled by an experienced teacher who met the test of their evaluation system over which the teachers and the union have no right to include in negotiations. Now the chancellor wants you to bless that failure. Please don't. And I just want to say fund, fund option two. Um, Ms. Collins? Uh, yes. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am Mary Collins, a former active teacher, uh, trustee on the D.C. Retirement Board, and uh, served 11 years as a field representative for the Washington Teachers Union, and presently I'm a retired uh, D.C. public schools teacher. I served uh, 33 years as a mathematics teacher in D.C. public schools. So I'm pleased to appear before you today to provide a brief statement of the pending um, Teacher Retirement Amendment Act of 2013. Uh, my uh, testimony, uh, I endorse what Mr. Uh, Martell has stated. He has eligibly uh, uh, presented the case um, uh, before you. But there are two things that I would like to add. Number one, uh, when teachers are forced into an involuntary uh, retirement, they have the penalty of uh, the age requirement. It's already in the statute that they can retire with uh, 25 years of service, um, and they can retire with 20 years of service and age 50. However, there is a 2% per year penalty uh, that they lose as a result of doing that. And so one of the things that I would ask that uh, uh, you seriously consider, for these teachers that are excess, through uh, this process, that, they, uh, that there be a waiver of the uh, uh, penalty 
for those persons. And the second point is, you may have a teacher that has worked 19 years uh, with, with outstanding um, uh, evaluation, and in one year they get an evaluation uh, that does not meet the test of what this legislation is proposing. And so what you are doing is in effect dismissing the, the, the work that these individuals have done. So um, is careful consideration must be given to the fact that this is already in the statute uh, for the Teachers Retirement Act, and therefore we should be looking for ways to reward people. If you want to reward them for evaluations, because the statute does not cover evaluation. Any teacher uh, that meets the qualification in the statute can take an involuntary retirement. So if we are going to reward these teachers, then most certainly the penalty should be waived. And um, I'd like to say thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity uh, to bring these points forward. And I will be adding an amendment uh, to, my, to my statement. Thank you, each of you. I'm a little confused by the disagreement. Let me ask uh, Ms. Um, Lewis, do you want to respond to what, what uh, the other two witnesses have said? Um, yes, I will respond with clarifying that currently um, the section of the D.C. official code that governs involuntary retirement, which is 38-2021.03b, list as a prerequisite that a teacher must be, be involuntarily separated. And then it goes on to list the criteria of having 25 years of service or having 20 years of service and being 50 years of age. But it's important to note, um, Chairman Mendelson, that the first prere prere prerequisite before you even get to um, the years of service and age is that you have to be involuntarily separated. Under our collective bargaining agreement, Teachers who are rated effective or higher on DCPS's performance-based evaluation tool, which is IMPACT, are not separated by DCPS when they do not find a job in the six, after the 60-day um, time frame of, being, um, of their excess and going into effect. Those teachers are given three options under the contract. What we are trying to do in this legislation is simply to codify that those teachers, if they forego one of those options, which is an extra year placement, will still be considered to be involuntarily separated. Um, because there are, understandably could be some confusion as to how a teacher who has the option to stay in the system but declines that option is considered to be involuntarily separated by DCPS. There can be an argument that that teacher has, vol has voluntarily separated themselves. We're trying to clear up any confusion and to classify those teachers um, also as involuntarily separated. It should also be noted um, that this will in no way limit teachers who are developing minimally effective or ineffective from using involuntary retirement. Those teachers do already meet that standard um, of being involuntarily separated. Those teachers have no rights to an option. They are separated on the 61st day um, after their effect after their notice of excess and goes into effect. Those teachers are separated by DCPS action. However, teachers who are effective or higher are not separated by DCPS action at that time. They are separated if they choose to separate themselves instead of taking an extra year um, placement, which is known as option three. The option three is in the contract. Yes. So one has to read the contract together with the statute. Um, the, the contract pr provides for an additional year of service, employment, mm -hmm. and the effect of this legislation is to allow the teacher to forego that year and to uh, get the retirement. That's the intended effect. However, we would not need to read our collective bargaining agreement um, to be able to interpret um, this statute. Um, all of the relevant definitions that that are relevant to this statute um, will be added are, are in the, the committee markup. Um, they are actually explicitly stated in, in the statute. So things like accessing um, and what constitutes an accessing will be in the statute so that you do not have to read the collective bargaining agreement in order to interpret the statute. I, uh, Mr. Martell or Ms. Collins, um, why, why is this a problem? Uh, well, it's a problem because, number one, in terms of the contract, um, the contract language does choose, or the teacher can choose, an excess teacher 
that meets the qualification. They are permanent and they have an evaluation. They gave up seniority in order to have the language put in the contract where they are to receive full retirement. But uh, it was based on the funding. Now that's not being addressed. That's, that's number one. And number two, the issue is that if a teacher is excess and they are not placed, they don't have to choose an option to have an involuntary retirement. They can simply retire under the statute that is presently in place. Now, in order to have excess teachers, you're not tagging evaluations. Well, the statute does not deal with evaluations at all. But now you're tagging this group of employees that happen to be effective or more effective and you're tagging them, and they have this, this penalty that they have to deal with. That is not to the advantage of the teacher. It's not to the advantage of D.C. public schools, in terms of the District of Columbia, in terms of attracting new personnel, and being able to, to honor what you have provided and laid out for these individuals that came here to work. Uh, what's the penalty? The penalty is 2% per year that you're younger than age 55. Well, the statute says uh, one-sixth of 1%. Right, but it's, 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 it's a total prorated based on the monthly basis, but it's 2% per year. Okay. 2% a year is what that works out on an annual basis. times one-sixth. Right. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the statute. Yes. All right. So if you have 20 years of service, and you take this involuntary retirement, sir, you are going to lose 2% per year for each year that you are younger than age 55. Because you say the contract is different than this? Yes, there is a section now, how in the contract. How can the contract be different than the statute? It, it, it was an amendment. It was added to. In other words, I'm sorry. You can a contract return. is not a statute. A contract yeah. can't invalidate a statute. No, but there's a contract language that says that if a teacher is excess, if a primary teacher is excess and they have an evaluation that's effective or greater, that they can retire with full benefits. That's what's in the contract. And full benefits mean that they will be given credit for 30 years of service. I'm being told that this was in an MO memorandum of agreement, which is not the same as a contract. It's in the contract, sir. 2007-2012 contract that was approved by the city council. Ms. Lewis, and the membership. can you help me here? Yes, I'm Chairman Mendelson. Um, uh, Ms. Collins is correct that that is in the current collective bargaining agreement. However, what uh, Ms. Jacobs has just handed you is a memorandum of understanding that um, actually um, amended uh, that that provision and is signed by President Saunders and Chancellor Henderson. And I think President Saunders, in his testimony um, today, will go more in depth into the relevance um, of that and be able to answer any questions about the history of the contractual provisions um, that you may have. Well, can you help me with that while you're at the table? Yes, yes. Um, there was an um, option two, as stated in the collective bargaining agreement, um, did allow a teacher to select, as the, if they selected that option, it stated that that teacher uh, would have full retirement ben benefits if they had 20 years of service. However, as you can see, is immediately um, followed by a clause that said that that is subject to necessary um, government and budgetary approval. Um, and I think that that is um, the process of trying to get that approval. Um, the money that DCPS was able to um, contribute and actually going through DCRB and doing actuarial studies and finding out um, how much that would actually cost to implement that provision um, is why we got to the memorandum of understanding that you yeah, have. Because here. It, um, the actual analysis found that it was going to be very costly. But it will be. Um, exponentially more costly than um, than estimated by either D, uh, WTU or DCPS. Costly to who? Uh, 
um, to DCPS and having to the money that they were setting aside to fund that provision. The money or the money that were needed to be set aside to fund that provision. Of course, the contract, if I'm looking at it, um, doesn't say who would pay it. Yes, the contract does not say that. So one could argue the teachers would have to pay it. Is that illogical? Um, mm -hmm. I would say that that is illogical because the contract is between uh, the Washington Teachers Union um, and the District of Columbia Public Schools and it's to provide retirement benefits which are provided by the District of Columbia. The reason why I ask that question mm -hmm. is that we've had uh, before us over the past half dozen years okay. um, modifications to various retirement provisions. I'm recalling with the um, police was one, and um, for recruitment purposes, if I remember correctly, that uh, they would be able to uh, elect to retire earlier, but the cost was going to be borne fully by the police officer there was an additional cost. That's my mm -hmm. recollection. And um, I know that we've also discussed with uh, EMS personnel that if they, they're not part of FIRE, but if they wanted to opt into the FIRE retirement system, uh, that they would have to pay the cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I asked the question, who would pay for this? Because the contract doesn't say what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. I have to say these designations are a little bizarre. 4.5.5.3.2.1 doesn't say who pays. Mm -hmm. But your impression was that the um, school system would pay. Yeah, I would argue that the uh, amendment saying that it was subject to necessary government um, approval implies that this would be some this would be some government entity and not WTU. Well, it strikes me as it being at odds with the statute. Correct? Um, yeah. Uh, the, the current collective bargaining agreement. The statute you know, says, involuntary the statute mm -hmm. says uh, involuntarily separated, uh, uh, reduced by, what did you say it was, 2% a year? 2% per year for each year you're younger than age 55. That's in the statute at the present time, yes. Yeah. And yes. I, I did, I, I, last time I checked, contracts can't modify statutes. Mm -hmm. So that would be part of the necessary government approval. Mm -hmm. No, I, I definitely agree, and I think that that is why we are here today um, seeking something other than that, that contract, which was unable to be enforced, um, that would give these teachers um, an option to retire as part of um, unable, being unable to find a position after the accessing process. Okay, so what you're saying is that um, even though there's this provision in the existing contract called option to early retirement, mm -hmm. that it's not effective. Yes, no, no teacher has been able to utilize that option. And it's not effective because there haven't been the necessary government and budgetary approvals? Yes. Okay, so as a result of that, you then, um, you meaning teachers union, entered into a memorandum of agreement. Is that correct? Um, the teachers union entered into a memorandum of agreement, yes. Okay. And what did that do? The memorandum of agreement um, it was entered into by Chancellor Henderson um, and President Saunders. I believe that he can speak more um, to your questions about it in depth, but briefly just to give you an overview, um, it was an agreement to use money that DCPS had initially um, set aside or planned to set aside to fund early retirement before they learned of the cost that early retirement actually would cost, to use those funds instead to um, provide a different option um, for teachers that would be able to be accessible um, by teachers um, with the amount of funds that DCPS actually had to, to provide to that option. I didn't understand what you just said. Uh, let me rephrase it. I'm sorry. Um, that the District of Columbia Public Schools has specifically set aside $1.7 million um, thinking that that would be enough to fund early retirement. Um, however, after an actuarial study was conducted by um, DCRB, um, the Retirement Board, um, and 
it was actually um, determined how many teachers would be funded uh, by $1.7 million. And I think President Saunders can go more um, in depth into that, um, but it would not have been a lot of teachers, um, less than a handful, that an agreement was made to instead use that money to provide um, another option that would be beneficial to teachers who were accessed um, and would be able to, to help more people um, than had that money been been dedicated to um, to early retirement. I'm not sure I completely follow, but basically this memorandum of agreement hasn't been fu sufficiently funded either. Is that what you're saying? Um, the, that's not what I'm saying. Um, that is true. The memorandum of agreement has not been funded yet, but I think that that will be coming before um, council shortly. Um, I'm looking at this a little more closely. I just just got it. The mm -hmm. um, the memorandum of agreement deals with unemployment benefits. Um, the memorandum of agreement is establishing a new benefit um, as option two because option two, as written, was unable to be enforced. But the new option two is unemployment benefit. Yes. So it doesn't deal with retirement at all. No. No. Okay, so that's not really helpful in terms of retirement. Exactly, which was what brings us here today. Um, the excess permanent status teachers um, are still in a position um, when they are effective or higher and they are not separated by DCPS. They are in need of an avenue by which they can retire um, if they are unable to find a permanent position in DCPS. All right, so let me go back to uh, Mr. Martell or Ms. Collins. So I'm beginning to understand this a little better. So what's wrong with the bill? Okay, what's wrong with the bill? I'm beginning to understand a little better. Yes, I know, maybe I've spoken. Maybe Mr. Martell can go first. Right. Okay. Um, <coughs> what is wrong with the bill? Now, excess teachers that are not placed, that meet the qualifications, so we are talking about the ones that meet the qualifications to receive an involuntary retirement. That's understood, okay? Which is already in the statute. Let's say as a teacher, I am excess and I'm not placed. I do not have to choose an option. But you have to wait a year. Pardon? But you have to wait a year. No, I do not. I do not have to wait a year. If I want to take an involuntary retirement because they haven't given me a job, for the next school year. That's that's one fact. Then if I choose an option, you are penalizing me for choosing one option that I can't select another option. Well, that is what's wrong. I should be able to retire on an involuntary retirement basis without any penalty of any sort. If you're going to use my evaluation, then I should be able to retire on an involuntary retirement without any penalties whatsoever. Well, let's see. The contract has option one buyout, option two early retirement, which yes. is not funded, and option three is a year to secure a new placement. Right. Okay. So a year to... Option three, a year to secure a new placement is you have to wait a year. So I want to choose option two. It's not funded. It's not available. Well, that, that, that is precisely the point. So, it's you're not funded. Funded. You're, so you're opposing this bill because option two is not funded. Exactly. But you're putting a substitute and you, you are a further convoluting the, the, the situation to the disadvantage of uh, the active teachers who are caught up in this excessive process. Well, frankly, I think option two is uh, contrary to law, unless the council amends the law. It says subject to net government, necessary government and budgetary approvals. Correct me if I'm wrong, but a contract can't amend the code. 
I, I agree with that, sir. Okay. And that is the reason. So all kinds of two things would have to happen. First of all, three things would have to happen. First of all, the executive would have to feel so motivated by option two that they propose legislation. The second thing is the council would have to be feel, feel so wonderful about this that they would adopt the amendment to the statute. And then third, there would be a, a, a chunk of change required, which Ms. Lewis only hinted at, which is apparently some exponential amount. So three things have to happen. Now, what we have before us is a bill that would enable early retirement with the 2% discount, which comes out to a maximum of 10%, correct? Because it's right. you have to be over 50. Right. So you're talking about a max five years. I'm trying to do my math. You guys are teachers. This is worrisome for me. But that comes out to a maximum penalty of 10%, but it happens. Yes, I understand that. So what would, what would be beneficial is that in this legislation, that an excess teacher that chooses the option to of a voluntary retirement will retire under the code as, as, as in the Teachers Retirement Act and have a waiver of the 2% because the condition, they have to meet a, a standard, a condition where their evaluation has to be... I get that. Yeah, okay, that's, unless, unless I'm missing something, yeah, that's their heads did not or... Because otherwise they can you. But unless I'm missing something, we'd have to A, amend the code, and B, we'd have to fund it. And I don't know what the what the cost is. But we'd have to fund it. Mm -hmm. we, I believe we have an actuarial analysis for this bill, which mm -hmm. says that we can go forward with this bill. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's not an actuarial analysis on funding option two, which is taking the retirement without a penalty. I'm sympathetic to taking the retirement because it's involuntary without a penalty, but um, finding the money is a problem. So um, that's the problem with that, and that's rather significant. Okay. And I will do an amendment. I have there are some other points that I will. Uh, bring out in terms of clarity of, of the issue uh, relating to this. But I think that excess teachers should have the right um, to have an involuntary um, a retirement. The, their concern is the, what they are going to lose as a result. Mr. Martel, do you want to say more? Well, <laughs> Um, Mary covered that whole aspect uh, better than I could. Uh, I, I was simply repeat what I said about impact. I mean, you know, one of the great advantages that impact was supposed to bring the District of Columbia was that it would be an evaluation tool that would lead to a selection of the best teachers and so on, and that would lead to improved student performance. That hasn't happened. It hasn't okay, but happened. now this hearing isn't about impact. Right, except that by bringing impact into this, we're beginning to see impact creep into a statutory situation of statutory validity. I mean, why, the reason why, why it, does that have anything to do with... But the reason why impact is being brought into us, as you put it, is because this, the bill, the committee print, says that the... Um, involuntarily separated teacher has to have had an evaluation of effective or higher. Correct? That's right, how they get the impact. Right, yeah. Okay. But yeah. that's in the collective bargaining agreement as well. Yeah. So we're not creeping anymore. The creep creeped. Or crept. Well, yes, it's in the collective bargaining agreement. Yes, I, uh, I certainly acknowledge that. But why... Why did, but there's no, it's not necessarily automatic that it must affect these, the retirement statute. Uh, I mean, as Mary said, you know, you could be teaching 19 years with a good evaluation and then you, you run up into, uh, into a bad evaluation and, and that somehow penalizes you as, you know, it stigmatizes you on the basis of one out of... You're absolutely right. But uh, Ms. Collins wants us to fund option two, which is contingent on a rating of effective or higher. 
unless I'm reading this wrong. Mm -hmm. And option and two says, this option shall only be available to permanent status teachers whose most recent evaluation score was effective or higher. Mm -hmm. So it's already there. So is the difference with the waiver versus non-waiver? I don't know. Well, you know, it, 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 it's, it's in option two is already already in the contract. You're right, it is not funded. Uh, the actual study, I don't I don't have an actual study on what it actually will cost, and, and I think that needs to be done. But well, you're talking cost, which I was uh, yeah. discussing with you, and Mr. Martell is talking about impact, and yeah. um, impact because Impact is where you get that uh, evaluation score of effective or higher. But that impact is not being introduced with this legislation. It was introduced with the contract. Yes, but, but um, uh, Mr. Chairman, without this language, if it didn't come before you, this new language, a teacher can have an involuntary retirement. It has nothing to do with his or her evaluation. What this does, it brings into it an addition. So you have what's already in the statute, plus you have another piece now that says, if you are excess, then uh, you have to have this. The, the evaluation is one of the requirements. I'm not the, va you. the evaluation is not a requirement, sir, for uh, involuntary retirement under the present statute. Yes, under the present statute. It is not. Involuntary re requirement. Uh, well, evaluation is not a requirement under the current the Teachers Retirement Act as it is. The 2% penalty is. The 2% penalty is, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this legislation, right, is now adding to that an evaluation component that becomes part of the involuntary retirement. It doesn't re replace that. It adds it. Yes, I say, it adds. Let me be clear. It, it, um, right, right now there's an option A and an option B under the code. I'm going to confuse everybody here. Option A, it, it's it's 38-2021.03A. A teacher who completes five years of eligible service and who is separated from the service, and it goes on. Subsection B says any teacher who completes five years of eligible service and who is involuntarily separated. So all we're talking about is involuntarily. And involuntarily right now has, I'm going to say, uh, one option, and that is you get that 2% penalty. penalty. Yeah. And, um, but you have to have been involuntarily separated under B. Right. Hold on, this gets confusing. You see, the problem is that um, under the contract, the contract lists three choices, one of which is not available. That's option two under the contract. Following me? Am I indicating? Mm -hmm. Yes, we're still following you. Okay, okay. the contract has three options. Option one is a buyout. The DCPS has to decide it's going to pay for the buyout. Correct. Okay, DCPS hasn't done that, so that option is not available. Um, option. DCPS. Are they can. doing buyouts? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So the teacher can take the buyout. The buyout. Mm -hmm. Teacher can take the buyout. Option two is they get the uh, full retirement. That's what we've been talking about. But uh, option two has not been funded, and I think it would require a statutory change. So option two is not available. Okay. It, option one is available. Yes. Option two is not available. So if the teacher doesn't take the buyout, which is a choice, they have option three, which is a year to secure a new placement. Yes. Those are your three options, one of which isn't available, correct? Only if they have an evaluation, sir, that is effective. That, that's the hanger. Mm -hmm. The hanger is the evaluation has to be effective or, or yes. better. Mm -hmm. Under the contract. Yes, that's the cliff. That's the hanger right there. Okay. Well, the teacher wants to take 
does not want the buyout, they can choose the uh, replacement, or, excuse me, one year, or they got nothing. All of those things are not available to a teacher who has a low evaluation. You have yeah, to I don't have think that's the issue here. Pardon? I don't think that's the issue here. I don't think that's the issue here. So if a teacher doesn't want to take a year and the teacher doesn't want to take the buyout for some reason, what are they to do right now? They can take the involuntary retirement because they will be separated and they will use the present statute. But they're not voluntarily retiring because they have the uh, option three, which is to uh, take a year, another year. But they may not be able to take advantage of option three because they're waiting. Okay, t I am a teacher who receives, uh, I don't know if they use NI, means improvement or whatever. In other words, it's, it's below effective. It's below effective, let's say. Let's forget about that. We'll talk about an effective teacher. An effective teacher. Sure, right. Okay, the effective teacher doesn't want the the um, buyout. Okay. Uh, the argument is that they're not eligible for the involuntary because they have the uh, option three, which is a year to secure new placement. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a problem that was sort of discovered, I guess, and but it's, a it's in there, but... Uh, that's a problem. Uh, so how do we do so that? Statute is a higher is a higher law than the contract in this in this regard. Just because you know DCPS made a mistake by not figuring out that people would uh, who would who went who opted for the extra year would then be eligible in some cases to take the buyout. Uh, now they want to shut that off because you're they... No, you're losing me on that one because the statute doesn't... Um, what the statute? A, a, an individual chooses whether they are going to... Maybe they don't really choose whether they're going to voluntarily or involuntarily retire. They make choices. An individual makes choices. Right. And for better or worse, the contract offers choices. Right. So if a teacher is being accessed, they have a choice. Buy out a year to secure a new placement. That's right. Because the third one has been eliminated. So what if they don't want to buy out or to wait a year? Then they have an involuntary retirement. I mean, just no, what years. if they choose they choose, they choose, one choose of those. not to buy out and they choose not to wait a year than what's available to them? Nothing, because they made a choice. Mm -hmm. But what if they do not? They want to retire. They want to retire. They want to retire. That's what the bill does. Ms. Lewis, am I missing anything here? No, you have gotten the problem and the, the solution that the bill is proposing um, precisely correct. Mm -hmm. And we should ensure that all teachers that meet the qualifications are eligible to receive whatever uh, uh, contributions, uh, funding, or whatever the retirement that, that they are to have. Because you mentioned some of the document about something about 1.7 million or something, or whatever, whatever. I don't, I don't, I don't have all the details. That's the memorandum of agreement, and it seems to deal with employment, unemployment benefits. Mm -hmm. So it's not retirement. Okay, I don't, I don't, and I don't even know if that's legal, but uh, it says that. Uh, yeah. I will do the research and uh, I will amend uh, my testimony. I think I can make it clearer once I see all of the documents. I mean, it sounds to me like the problem here is the contract, because the contract put forth the hope, the contract put forth the prospect that a teacher who's accessed would be able to get um, full retirement without a reduction. That's right. Okay, the contract put forth that prospect, but that doesn't mean that prospect is a reality, and it's not. Correct. That's what I'm stuck with. Correct. You're correct. And I think it's not a reality for two reasons. One, because legislation would have to amend the law, and two, because it would have to be funded. And I don't know what the cost is, but you used the word exponential, which sounds like a big amount. <laughs> okay. 
Now, I mean, you, you got a couple of days to uh, reflect on this. And I know. If there's something wrong in my logic, but I'm working my way through this in a pretty public way, and no, and, and I, I think I'm making sense. Okay. Thank you. I do. I, I do appreciate. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it very much, and I will uh, respond with an amendment. Okay. Okay. Uh, any of you want to add anything at this point? Um, I just want to clarify that nothing in this bill will prevent a teacher um, who is involuntarily separated, those are teachers who are less than effective, from receiving involuntary retirement. As long as you are involuntarily separated, you, you can qualify for involuntary retirement. This bill is, seeking, is simply seeking to expand that definition of involuntary retirement to also include those teachers who want to leave the system, but as you stated before, because of they have other choices, are not being separated by DCPS. Um, if those teachers are separated, it's because they have chosen another option or they have chosen not to choose any option at all, which can be argued that those teachers ha are were not involuntarily separated by DCPS, but that they have voluntarily chosen to separate themselves from DCPS. Okay. Thank you all. Remember, uh, we're scheduling markup for Tuesday, April 30th, so get us our co your comments, please, uh, by close of business on Monday. Thank okay. you. Thank now, you. Now, Tuesday is not the end of it because first reading will be uh, May 7th. Mm -hmm. That's our current uh, plan, and I know the hearing notice has a different uh, date on it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, Nathan Saunders, I saw him come in, if you would come forward. Is there anybody else present who wishes to testify before I call the um, government witnesses? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson. I want to uh, uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to uh, present uh, in front of you. Uh, I must say, every time I've come uh, to the City Council and you've uh, been the Chairman, I've gone to Room 500, and I went to Room 500 today, and Ms. Che is up there, and so I was a few minutes late, but uh, thank you uh, for this hearing. Um, I have prepared testimony. I believe that we have provided you a copy, but uh, based upon what I just heard, I, I certainly am interested in answering a lot of questions about the history, how we got to where we are. Some information uh, I can share with you uh, would be in, in extremely helpful, but I, I do want to say this, uh, that uh, I represent the Washington Teachers Union who are about 4,000 active teachers who provide educational services to about 45,000 kids in the District of Columbia uh, public schools. I'm not here to uh, exert upon the council my personal uh, point of view. I'm here to uh, represent WTU in my official capacity. Uh, this bill, which uh, the WTU, not Nathan Saunders, is interested in, is a bill that has passed the muster of accountants, actuarialists, uh, CPAs and executive board and it remains important to teachers. It's the Teacher Retirement Amendment Act of 2013. It's vital to members for two reasons. Uh, one is it, it will begin to address the failure of the district to perform a contractual obligation to WTU. I think you, um, <coughs> excuse me, you earlier referred to it, what's in the contract and what's reality. Now, uh, there is uh, a difference. Secondly, it will make involuntary retirement access accessible to a limited class of teachers who otherwise may not be classified as involuntarily separated by D.C. public schools. The Teacher Retirement Amendment Act of 2013 will begin to correct an ongoing issue Excuse me, with the district's inability to provide early retirement to teachers as required by the current collective bargaining agreement between WTU and DC Public Schools. Section 4.5.5.3.2, uh, otherwise known as Option 2, states in part excess permanent teachers with 20 years or more of critical service shall have the option of retirement with full benefits. It goes on to state, this option shall only be available to permanent teachers whose most current evaluation uh, was effective or higher. 
I didn't invent that language. This is a collective bargaining agreement that was in place on day one in which I uh, assumed the presidency of WTU. Uh, this option has never been made available to any WTU member. Not one individual has received this option uh, in, in, at all. Now, as part of an effort to enforce this contractual provision, WTU procured an actuarial study for the District of Columbia Retirement Board that revealed that option two was not only economically unfeasible, but it also required a change in the federal retirement regulations. Therefore, WTU and DCPS entered into a negotiated agreement to replace option two with a new option that provides supplemental health and financial benefits to excess teachers. Currently, there is no option that provides any avenue for excess teachers who are effective or hired to retire when they cannot secure a permanent position. The Teachers Retirement Amendment Act of 2013 will correct this situation by allowing excess teachers who are effective or hired to retire under involuntary retirement provided that they meet the statutory age and years of service requirement of that provision. It's important to note that the Teachers Retirement Amendment Act of 2013 is designed to assist only those who are effective and hired, uh, who are accessed by DCPS but not offered permanent placements within the system. These teachers, because of their high performance ratings, are not automatically separated from DCPS when they are unable to secure a permanent position at another DCPS school. This often creates a situation where the excess effective or highly effective teacher who otherwise meets the age and years of service requirements to afford involuntary retirement must be selected, must select the CBA options that grants another year another additional year. So they're required to stay in the system because they're not involuntarily separated. It is only after completing the additional year that the teacher can involuntarily separate by, uh, can be separated by DCPH, PS, and merit involuntary retirement. Uh, this act will correct the situation in a manner that is mutually beneficial to teachers and DCPS by allowing teachers to forego an extra year placement and immediately qualify for involuntary retirement. Considering the exponential increase in excess teachers that will occur at the end of this school year, because of school consolidations, if this legislation is passed, DCPS will have a system that will permit teachers who want to retire to leave without the need of staying an additional year. An actuarial study has been conducted by Kavanaugh McDonald Consulting LLC and this act will have a de minimis impact on the DCRB retirement plan. It is clear that this legislation will benefit all stakeholders. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have about my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saunders. I think I've kind of questioned myself out, but uh, let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, sure. Do you understand, the statute right now says any teacher who completes five years of eligible service and who is involuntarily separated from the service, uh, I'm skipping a little, after completing 25 years of service, I don't understand, At, completes five years, uh, but then has completed 25 years. Do you understand that language? Yeah, yes, sir, I do. Um, there is a point at which, uh, uh, and a teacher in DCPS is, it commonly referred to as vested in the system. That's five years. That's five years. And the involuntary uh, uh, retirement provisions simply require some additional set of rules like 25, 25, years. 25, years, 25 years, and then you can involuntary. Now, you get a reduced annuity, yeah, but you can nevertheless retire. Now, for, but there's the same language in the previous uh, subparagraph. Any teacher who completes five years of eligible service and who is separated from the service after becoming 55 years of age and completing 30 years of service, Nichols, I'm not reading all of it. Sure. Um, I mean, it just strikes me as a little odd. I get that five years you vest, but you've vested at 30 years, too. So why even have that? I'm going to ask Ms. Pastorino the same question. 
Yes. I mean, why say any teacher who's completed five years who's completed 30 years? Yes. Well, any teacher who's completed five years and has completed 25 years. Yeah. The I, I, I tell you, I have uh, been so um, uh, enamored by the retirement law, I chose to join the D.C. Retirement <laughs> Board, for the record. Yeah. Uh, it is very complicated. It's complicated for our members. But what we, this piece of legislation seeks to do is it leaves the retirement law in place with the exception of one change, which is one line in the retirement law, which addresses those individuals who are excess permanent teachers who cannot find placement. They are allowed to uh, secure involuntary retirement as long as they meet DC, the D.C. Retirement Board's um, uh, qualifications as to an involuntary uh, retirement. Uh, right now, uh, they oftentimes are required to stay, stay in the system. They choose or choose option three and then wait until one year later and they're involuntarily separated. Uh, part of, if I need to further comp uh, uh, complicate this issue. Part of the challenge with this is that the Office of Employee Appeals has a, their version of what involuntary separation is. DCPS has its view and the DC Retirement Board has its view. Now, we want to codify, put into law what is clearly an important issue for uh, individuals who seek, uh, who find themselves in this position and who seek to leave the system but are not technically and voluntarily separated. Let me, I, I would like to take an opportunity to explain it slightly different. If you were a teacher with 20 years and you received a bad evaluation, you could involuntarily retire under the existing law. You would be separated from the system if you received uh, a bad evaluation and somehow you couldn't find a placement or you was forcefully, ineffective was the evaluation. You were separated. You were qualified because you were officially separated from the system to say, show up at DCRB. I'm 55 years of age. I've got 25 years of service. I'm taking advantage of involuntary retirement. But if you were the same teacher, 55, 25, and you had a good evaluation, you could be required to move into option three, which in fact will require you to stay one more year and then after the one more year you will be separated. That is the reason why uh, when we look at the Kavanaugh uh, actuarial study, this is a benefit because it allows the teacher to leave. It allows the district to, to go on with this business and uh, that teacher is, is able to, to move forward in retirement without staying and uh, the additional year and additional cost. Some situations that we have in school, we have individuals, we have, uh, I can tell you for a fact, nine individuals who have applied and who are interested in leaving DCPS right now. They are simply, and they've been waiting, they've been actually been waiting for about two years now to leave, but this issue has been outstanding and unresolved. We have a solution, and the solution includes not only this uh, change in law, but it also includes the negotiated modification to the contract that Chancellor Henderson and I uh, negotiated that creates what is known as Aviva. And I want to make sure you brought out some questions about, well, Aviva. Well, not Aviva, but you brought a question about unemployment benefits. Well, the Aviva is the unemployment benefits, isn't it's it? It's unemployment benefits. It's also health uh, benefits. Uh, uh, you're correct. So uh, it does include those benefits. But those benefits can be used in addition, in, over and above, and in addition to the retirement. Correct. They're separate from the retirement. That's correct. Now, presently, those individuals who, for whatever reason, found themselves in an involuntary state don't, don't have any access to a VIBA or uh, a fully funded uh, retirement. Because option two, as originally installed in that contract, never worked, it was never fought for, and I want to be really, really clear, I assumed the presidency of WTU on December 1, 2010. That contract is from a period of 2007 through 2012. Yeah, but when was it executed? It was executed uh, June of uh, 2010. 
Okay. So it was executed five, six months before you became president? That's correct. I did not negotiate it on a contract, but it was a provision in there, and teachers expected to be able to use option two as written in there, and they never received the opportunity to do that. Well, I have to say, that, and this is not your fault, but it's, it's mildly offensive that um, a contract would be negotiated that would require, would expect, would assume that the legislature is going to amend the re retirement law. I mean, this is a variation of what we saw in 2007 when Peter Nichols negotiated the uh, contract with um, the then nominated uh, chief of police which required a number of changes to the law. Like, well, we're just going to go, we're, we're not going to pay attention to the law, we're going to just negotiate something that will require the law to be changed. Yes. And uh, that's, that's what this does. I, I, I would agree exactly with you, and I, and I want to tell you the numbers, what the financial impact. The numbers look like this. When I became president in 2010, in December, the first thing I said, I sat down with the chancellor and Mr. Cameron and said, listen, you guys have never come through with option two. If you do not come through with option two or fund it, what I will do is I'll try to void the entire contract. It took time. We negotiated. I went to the city council. I had a couple meetings here. I went to DCRB uh, asking for advice. How do we make this work? And what we concluded was this. Not only would it require a change in the district law, in the retirement code for Washington, D.C., it would also require a modification to the federal, uh, legis the, federal reg regis mm, the federal regulations, okay? Because and, uh, a lot of these uh, teachers, by, because they're 20 and more years of service, are pre-1987. That's correct. And therefore, uh, it's federal law that applies to their benefits. That's correct. And the amount of money that we were working with was such an amount that we would not get more than five teachers through full retirement. It did not make sense from where I sat as a president of the union. It didn't make sense for the membership. We could make five people out of 4,000 incredibly happy, but we would make 3,995 very, very sad. We created a tool called the VIVA, which which is designed, we could get hundreds of people through our VIBA system and we could help teachers through that system. Yeah, but again, VIBA is not retirement, but it, it's, it's not. It's a supplement. It's a supplemental um, um, unemployment and you said uh, health. That's correct. And uh, I, for the record, if you would allow me to state exactly, what will happen is a teacher will receive over a period of five years through the VIVA $106,500 over five years. The first year will be approximately $20,000, another $20,000, second year, another $20,000, third, and so on. Now, that teacher would also receive for the first 18 months through a temporary continuing coverage uh, process, they would receive their full health benefits paid by the VIVA trust fund. That's what will happen. For five years, starting at the date in which they were awarded, they will also be able to receive dental and optical for a period of five years. There's, a short, there's an insurance provision associated with the VIVA. And what that will do is, say for example, you retire and after the second year you die, okay? You only receive approximately $40,000 out of that out of the system, what will happen is the balance of your money in the system will be paid immediately to your beneficiary. The $60,000 or so will be paid to your beneficiary. So those are the components. Presently, the teachers, that doesn't exist. Now, I do want to enter, uh, I met with the city administrator yesterday at the request of the mayor. Uh, because this uh, amount of money is over $1 million, it's required to be presented to the council. The mayor is in the process of presenting it to the council. We sent over the trust documents. It's got to go to the uh, chairperson, and it's got to lay over for a certain period of time, uh, as do all contracts over $1 million. But that is, in terms of the funding, DCPS can speak to the funding of the VIVA. The letter of agreement clearly states that the commitment is there for the budgets of five years going into the future. That's what signed off on. The money is there. But what's clear is 
the what was put in that contract is a pie in the sky. It never happened. It never will happen. And so what I'm what I'm tasked with is to help people where they are and to create uh, uh, create a fusion and so that folks can move forward. That's what we're trying to do here. Um, I would have never signed. I would have. I was against that particular provision because I didn't think it would happen. It didn't happen. And quite candidly, I think the people who negotiated probably knew it would never happen either. Let me see if I have another question. I don't think I have any other questions. Uh, you'll be, you'll stick oh. around. Yes, sir, I will. So, um, if something else occurs to me, I'll call you back up. Yes, sir. Thank okay. you. Thank you, each of you. Let's turn now to Joan Pastorino, who's Chief Benefits Officer with the District of Columbia Retirement Board, and Jana, or is it Jana uh, Woods Jefferson, who is uh, Director of Benefits and Compensation, Human Resources, Depart District of Columbia Public School System. Are you having a good time so far sitting in the audience? <laughs> yes. I've learned a lot. <laughs> good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and members of the Council uh, of the uh, District of Columbia Committee of the Whole. I am Joan Passarino, District of Columbia Retirement Board's Chief Benefits Officer. I am pleased to be here today to provide you with testimony related to DCRB, the pension plans that we administer, and the legislation being considered at this hearing. As you know, DCIB is the plan administrator for the District of Columbia Police Officers and Firefighters Retirement Plan and the District of Columbia Teachers Retirement Plan. And we are the custodian of the plan's assets. As the plan administrator, we cannot take positions on modifications to the benefit provisions of the plans. That is the role of the plan sponsor, the District of Columbia. We are happy, however, to provide information about plan benefits and to answer questions about the provisions of the plans we administer and the potential impact of this legislation. The purpose of a pension plan is to, is to give an organization the ability to recruit, retain, and provide income security for its employees during their retirement years. To accomplish that purpose, DCIB's mission is to prudently invest the pension assets of the police officers, firefighters, and teachers of the District of Columbia while providing those employees with total retirement services. The District of Columbia Police Officers and Firefighters Retirement Fund and the District of Columbia Teachers Retirement Fund are the funds that support the plans. These funds are managed and controlled by DCRB and their assets are held in trust for the exclusive benefit of all participants, their survivors, and their beneficiaries. The assets that, um, in the trust will only be used to pay benefits to plan members and reasonable expenses required to administer the plans. Trustees who serve on the board are required by law to act solely in the interest of the participants, whether those participants are actively employed by the district or retired. Benefits under these plans, which the district established on July 1st, 1997, are based on a service accrued after June 30th, 97, and are financed by the district. These plans were established pursuant to the Police Officers, Firefighters, and Teachers Retirement Benefit Replacement Plan Act of 1998. Under a memorandum of understanding with the U.S. Treasury Department, DCIB also assumed the same administrative responsibilities for participants hired prior to July 1, 1997, whose benefits are the responsibility of the U.S. Treasury Department. DCIB acts as a third-party administrator for U.S. Treasury regarding the administration of benefits under the District of Columbia Police Officers and Firefighters and Teachers Retirement Plans that are the responsibility of the federal government. Those plans were frozen as of June 30th, 1997, 
and only apply to members whose benefits are based on service accrued through June 30th, 1997. As plan administrator, DCIB is responsible for interpreting the provisions of the plans as well as legislation that may change those provisions and to, pro and to apply the provisions fairly and uniformly to all eligible participants. Establishing plan participation eligibility, benefit levels, uh, retirement age, cost of living adjustments and the like are plan design matters that are the responsibility of the plan sponsor, the District of Columbia government. With respect to the purpose of this hearing, as DCIB understands it, the current legislation stems from the provision in the 2002 to 2012 collective bargaining agreement between the District of Columbia Public Schools, DCPS, and the Washington Teachers Union, WTU, that was approved by the council on June 29, 19, uh, 2010. That provision referred to as option two indicated that teachers, certain teachers, who were accessed would be permitted to retire early with full benefits. Following an actuarial analysis, however, the funding for this benefit change was not approved. Ms. Pastorino, do you know what that, um, what that actuarial, uh, what the cost was going to be under that actuarial analysis? Uh, with Mr. Saunders' uh, um, permission, since uh, they, they purchased that. Um, okay. um, my understanding, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that there were eight people who were selected under option two initially. We sent that information to the actuary and asked them to apply the provisions of option two as it was then written. And they came up with a number that was in excess of seven million dollars, compared with the 1.7 million per year that was uh, set aside for uh, this pension purpose. Only eight teachers. Only eight, and uh, essentially, uh, they were to select a certain number of those individuals who were excess each year. The mix would have been different. Um, uh, the cost uh, depended on the age of the individual at that time um, and the number of years of service they had. Well, eight was a sample or eight was the universe? Eight was the total number of people that I understood um, were considered to be eligible at that time. And the cost of those eight would have been seven million? Over seven million dollars. And if that, since it was an iterative um, process, over five years, if you had another eight the next year, it would have been a similar number potentially. Uh, we have no idea what it would have been because it was uh, dependent upon the demographics of the individuals selected or who qualified sure, each year. Sure, sure. So um, because it's an ongoing contract, the, it might have been eight uh, at one time, but in the future there would be possibly more. Or it could have been fewer. It depended on other criteria. Okay. I interrupted you. Thank you. Okay. Where was I? Um, uh, let's see. I think you were starting with during their 2012 negotiations. Oh, yes. Thank you. During their 2012 negotiations, DCPS and the WTU agreed that DCPS would commit $1.7 million annually over a five-year period to fund this benefit and the Public School Teachers Retirement with Dignity Amendment Act of 2012 was introduced to implement it. When an actuarial analysis concluded that the fiscal impact exceeded the funds allotted for the benefit change, DCPS and the WTU renegotiated the, the issue and agreed to use the committed funds for other purposes for excess teachers. And Mr. Uh, Saunders has mentioned that that went into Aviva. The current legislation reflects a revision where instead of providing a new early retirement benefit, certain excess teachers will be classified as involuntarily separated from DCPS, and as a result, they will be eligible for the existing early retirement provisions under the teacher's plan, plan's involuntary retirement option, which states that any teacher who completes five years of eligible service 
and who was involuntarily separated from the service except for removal for cause um, on charges of misconduct or delinquency after completing five, 25 years of service or becoming 50 years of age and completing 20 years of service is entitled to an annuity reduced by one-sixth of one percent for each full month such teacher is under age 55 years at the date of his separation from the service. The proposed legislation adds a sentence to the end of this section which states that an excess permanent status teacher who is unable to find a permanent placement and whose most recent evaluation score is effective or higher shall be considered involuntarily separated. Since the actual effect of the legislation is simply to codify that being excessed is a category of separation that may be interpreted as involuntary separation under, um, as defined under uh, Section 38.2021.03, uh, uh, parens B, the actuaries have determined that the financial impact of this change would be de minimis. DCRB is in agreement with that assessment. This concludes my testimony. I look forward to answering any questions that you may have uh, regarding the effect of this legislation on the district's plans. And thank you for your consideration of DCRB's testimony. Thank, thank you. Um, and my understanding is that um, Ms. Woods Jefferson, you're here to answer questions. Yes, you don't that's have correct. A statement. Um, Ms. Pastor, let me start with the question I asked Mr. Saunders. It's not critical, but the five why does the statute say any teacher who uh, completes five years of eligible service and who completes 25 years of service? It's to establish that those five years must be in DCPS under uh, district service. Uh, those five years not only uh, uh, put somebody uh, in a position of having some skin in the game, if you will, but also it's the number of years required to be vested under the plan. But isn't the 25 years of service or 20, depending upon the, uh, the uh, provision? That provision doesn't, that, doesn't that have to be in, in DCPS? Right. Well, no. That's the, that's the reason for the initial five, because uh, teachers can, in fact, purchase service that can be creditable toward their retirement. And they are not to, uh, this is to require that a teacher at least have five years of uh, service with the uh, district's public school system in order to be considered uh, eligible to retire. I right, so, so the five years of eligible service is a defined term or it's a term of art? Uh, in, in essence, in the, yes. In the statute. And the 25 years or 20 years, depending, um, might, not, it might not be entirely in DCPS. That's correct. All right, so that's the reason for that. Yes. Um, the actuarial study that we have was done by Kavanaugh and McDonald. Yes. It's dated April 17, 2013. Yes. You've seen it. Yes, I have. Um, the statute requires technically that the mayor has to purchase, pay for the um, study. Do you have any issue with this actuarial analysis? No. And this is your actuary? Yes, it is. So, um, in terms of the substance, the merits, the, uh, the substantive issue, um, this, this meets everything that the Retirement Board could possibly want. Yes, they've looked at the issues. They've uh, uh, done an analysis. Um, they've determined that the change that is being uh, suggested here uh, it, it, is, it does not it have a significant effect on the, uh, yes. the plans. But what I'm getting at, and I don't want to debate the, the statute that says the mayor has to pay for the actuarial analysis. Uh, there's some reasons why the statute's worded the way it is. I think it's in part that the actuary has to be somebody that uh, is um, um, known to and acceptable to the retirement board. Right. The, uh, and that the analysis has to be something that's understood and acceptable by the retirement yes, board yes and that it's not we're not just going off oh i'm going to pull this actuary mm -hmm. out of the air and present it to the legislature and based on that right. we're going to say it's okay no it has to be right. more prescribed so right 
that, that's what I'm kind of getting at here, is that this is completely satisfactory. Absolutely. The, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the, the DCIB prefers that it's actually be hired for this purpose because they're, uh, it ensures, first of all, that we're familiar, uh, or that we're aware that uh, these uh, uh, types of um, uh, changes are being contemplated, but it also ensures that there's an objective analysis that's written, and it's written by somebody who's familiar with the plans and the provisions of the plans. And, uh, and all that has been met here. Yes. Um, does this bill, because we, we dealt with some legislation last fall. You testified, um, I think that it was the Judiciary Committee. Um, there, w there are participants in the plan who are basically, I'm going to say federal, because there's yeah. a pre-1987, and then there are participants in the plan who are... 97. Okay, 97. 97. Yes. Well, we have 97. We also have the 87 for the uh, when they were hired. Uh, maybe that doesn't apply. That has to do with um, health care, life insurance, and that kind of thing. Okay. The, these uh, plans were not separated. Uh, the, the federal plan was frozen in 97. Okay, so 97 is the yes. date. So we have some who are pre-97, some mm -hmm. who are post-97. What we're doing here, does this only uh, benefit or is it only applicable to some of the teachers or is it everybody? Uh, my, uh, well, I cannot speak for the federal government uh, and specifically not for the Department of the Treasury, but the effect of the change is such that the only thing this is doing is codifying this particular category as being uh, considered involuntary separation. Actually, the school system, since the statute says involuntary separation, it's really the school system that defines what that is. This is codifying that um, accessing comes under that. Um, since it doesn't make a significant change, or any change es essentially to the statute. And this provision of the statute is in fact frozen under the federal plan and there's a de minimis um, cost to it. My personal opinion is that it perhaps would not have an effect on the federal plan. But I can't say that, I would have to ask that folks at the Treasury Department to render an opinion as to how they believed that this uh, statute affects their plan. In other words, it may or may not. It may or it may not. Uh, benefit the um, teachers who are under with, the federal plan. Right. With anyone who has uh, service prior to July 1 of 97, which is when the district's plans were put into place have their, their service under the federal government, under the federal plan, which is the responsibility of the federal government. And it would be their responsibility to, or their uh, authority, to uh, determine whether there, there is a, an effect on their plan by this change to our statute. And if they decide that it does have an effect, then they could say that this does not apply to their teachers. They could do that, yes. It would take a change, if they believed that it did, it would take a change uh, through Congress uh, to their plans to uh, align, align the, the two programs. So assuming that this legislation passes, mm -hmm. you would then be in contact with Treasury. Yes. And based on this conversation, Mr. Saunders probably will be in contact with Treasury. Yes. And so there's still some discussion that needs to take place before this would help the teachers who have retirement prior to have uh, retirement benefits that uh, predate 1997. Right. Since they need 20 years of service. That's going to be everybody. It would, it would touch everyone because yes. our plans have only been in place since 97, which is what's now 16 years. So there's another four to go. Correct. Uh, so there's still another step. That's there is one more step, yes. And that is Treasury. But what I'm hearing from you is that uh, an argument could be made to Treasury because the effect is de minimis that uh, they should not, um, 
they should not take the position that this change to the district statute mm -hmm. um, does uh, has no effect on the I'm going to call them the federal plan right yes we, we can discuss that with them I think that they probably would want to do their own assessment with their own actuaries but um, uh, it, it, it is highly likely that they could come down with the same um, uh, result that we did, that our actuaries did. One would hope. I understand you can get multiple actuaries in a room and get multiple opinions. Yes. One would hope it would all be pretty close. Right. You're agreeing? I agree with that, yes. I'm looking to see uh, additional questions. Will this legislation have any impact on internal retirement board operations? Not that I know of. Uh, and although your testimony, um, I assume, addressed this, I'm just going to ask, do you see any issues with the legislation? Not, not really. Um, when we receive um, retirements from DCPS, they've already determined that you know, they are the, the, the plan, part of the plan sponsor, part of the, uh, uh, the executive, if you will. Uh, they determine whether somebody's uh, uh, service and age meet the criteria for retirement under the plan. DCRB is the plan administrator. We calculate the benefit and assure that the individual was paid. We, we don't totally disregard the provisions of the plan. If we saw something that that didn't line up right, we certainly uh, would have a conversation. Johnny and I are, are talking on the phone all the time, but um, they are the primary determiner of whether somebody qualifies. In this case, they are the ones that are, are totally uh, determining whether somebody meets the criteria of involuntary separation from their system. Uh, Ms. Woods Jefferson, um, you're here on behalf of DCPS? That's correct. We don't actually have a statement from the executive or DCPS with regard to this legislation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're in a position where you can say, did, does DCPS support this legislation? Chairman, I can speak on behalf of the system if you'd like. Then you have to come forward and identify yourself. My name is Jason Kamers. I'm the Chief of Human Capital for the school system. Your last name is spelled? Kamers, K-A-M-R-A-S. Uh, yes, the school system is in support of the legislation and has worked with the WTU to put this in place to uh, help us all move forward uh, beyond the difficulties we've had with option two. I don't know if I can ask for better than that. Um, <laughs> the, um, do you know, um, can we represent that you're, you're speaking for the executive or just for DCPS? Just for DCPS. Okay, and again, DCPS is in support of this legislation. Correct. Um, you were present when I was asking about the um, whether this would actually benefit those teachers who contributed to the retirement system prior to 1997. That's everybody at this point who would be accessed. Um, do you have any concern about that or reaction about that? Um, I don't have a concern other than, as you have noted, Treasury may have something to say about that. Uh, but again, given that the analysis suggests it's de minimis, our hope is that they would not ob object to our proceeding. Now, would you be the one who talks to Treasury, or would you rely entirely on the Retirement Board? Um, I would defer to the Retirement Board. That means you're not. We would work seat? together. We would work in partnership. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think that's important. We, we are certainly in support. Um, I would imagine that the Retirement Board has more of those relationships. We do. I think I heard Ms. Pastorino say we do. And we work with DCPS frequently on yes. issues that come up. So this would not be different than anything that we've done before. Uh, 
Uh, let me just ask, uh, I guess ask, I'm not sure who I'm asking, but from DCPS. Um, so with the um, school consolidations, we're, we expect we're going to see some um, accessing of teachers, correct? Correct. And um, so what exactly, uh, kind of give me some description of what's going to happen. Uh, Teacher Smith is accessed. Uh, so they're going to get a choice of um, taking a year to get another, see if there's another placement within DCPS, or they'll be able to choose this early retirement because they have more than 20 years. Just help me with Well, if I may, let me back up a little bit. So uh, later in the month of May, they'll receive official notification that they are, in fact, being accessed. Um, the effective date of the excess is typically the last day of the school year. From that point, they have 60 days to find what we call a mutual consent placement, and that is a placement that is agreed to by the teacher and by a hiring principal at another school. If they're able to find a placement during that period, they're on a budgeted position for the following year, and that's the end of it. If they're not able to find a position during that 60-day period is when some of the discussion today comes into play. And then we divide those groups of individuals into really two subgroups. One is anyone who has less than an effective rating. Those, in, yeah. those individuals are separated at the end of the 60-day period. And then we get to the group that has a rating of effective or higher. Wait a minute. Um, I thought you said the, the notice will be in May and it's effective June 28th. The start of the 60-day clock is the end of the, the last day of the school year, typically. So they're not separated. The notice doesn't say you're separated at the end of the year. Correct. It says you're what at the end of the year? It says you have 60 days from this date to find a placement, a budgeted uh, position, um, after which, uh, if you have a rating of effective or higher, you are eligible for these options. If not, you will be separated from the school system. Are, the options are buyout. Correct. Are you paying a buyout? We are, and we did last year. And I think that's twenty-five thousand. Correct. Um, or the a year to secure a placement. Correct. Well, so what does that look like? We actually place the teacher at a school into a position where they serve as a teacher, uh, either as a full classroom teacher or in a support capacity with a subgroup of students. Roughly how many teachers do you think will be accessed? Roughly. Um, with the consolidations this year uh, in the order of five to six hundred. Okay, so um, the five or six hundred, let's say, would it be unreasonable to just guess there that maybe a hundred will not find, will not find a placement in 60 days and they'll be effective? Um, I think that's reasonable. I don't have the historical data. Okay, I'm not going to hold you to the yeah. number. So you could, on the first day of school, have 100 teachers who you are then going to place in schools because they didn't get a placement in the 60 days. And did not choose the buyout. And did not choose the buyout. That's correct. Though we know that prior to the start of school, uh, mid-August. So, so a, a teacher at a uh, elementary school um, has a budget and decides going to hire X number of teachers we hire keep sure. presumably they're keeping all the same teachers because they're all good um, and then you may come along and say we got this extra teacher Mendelssohn who nobody picked up and we're going to give him to your school correct and then the principal gets an extra teacher I'm not saying that's a bad thing the teacher's principal is probably happy but so that's what may happen correct that is in fact what does happen the principal would get some extra teachers correct and we work with the regional superintendents to identify the best placements for those individuals to meet particular needs that we may know the school has, but we were not able to achieve with the current budget. And who's picking up their salary? Central administration? The school, the school system pays that. As opposed to the individual school? Uh, correct. So that's kind of a pretty good deal for the principals. <laughs> it is. Uh, so that's um, for the teachers who are rated effective, who choose to... Or higher. Or higher. Or higher. Um, and who choose to take that year to secure new placement. Correct. Now, presumably, they may be teachers who uh, don't have the uh, 20 years, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the retirement doesn't, isn't available to them. Correct. I'm 
I'm hesitating because I had a question in there somewhere and I can't remember it now. The 60 days. When's the last day of school? Uh, this year, I believe it's going to be June 23rd. That sounds right. I, I, I think we're, we, we had a change because of some makeup days. I think the makeup days are changing half days to full days. Correct. That Thursday and Friday. I believe so. So the Friday is still the last day of school. I believe so. Yes. Okay. We that, that might. We should check the calendar. Yeah. <laughs> to see what it is. Somebody's checking. Uh, you think it's June twenty third? When's the first day of school? Um, I don't have that off the top of my head either, but we could pull that up. Well, what I'm getting at is is sixty days exactly the distance between the last day of school and the first day of school? Uh, a fair question. My my sense is that the it's off by about five days. Yeah, mm -hmm. something of that order. Yeah. Does that make sense? I guess it has nothing to do with this bill, but does sure. that make sense? Um, it's not ideal, but it's what was negotiated in the contract. Would well, you think Mr. Saunders would be upset if you gave him 65 days? <laughs> um, I actually think it would be helpful for it to be a shorter period in that we're able to make those decisions in advance of the start of school to allow principals and schools to be um, more adequately ready at the start of the school year. I'm not sure that he would agree. Yeah, I, I would think so, but, but there are two ways of looking at this, yes. and that is um, from the standpoint of the principal, the principal wants to hire as early as possible before Correct. the school year. Correct. The principal has the ability to do that. So teacher Mendelssohn has been accessed. Correct. Teacher Mendelssohn goes to the school. There's nothing that stops the principal from, um, from hiring teacher Mendelssohn. Correct. So early is completely within the con less than sixty days is completely in control of the control of the principal. Correct. From the standpoint of the teacher, having until the first day of school would be ideal because nobody's picked them up in thirty days and they have another thirty five days. I understand. From the standpoint of the school system, though, and from the standpoint of principals and being able to start the school year with certainty around where all these people are. Um, there might be a benefit to a somewhat shorter window. Well, yeah, but do you think a teacher is going to wait 65 days to go to a school and ask? I'm saying 65 because that's a little bit more. Understood. Um, no, the teacher is going to be checking around the schools right away, don't you think? You would think so, and in most cases that's true. In but some, not in all. But not in all. And that's the rub. Correct. Hmm. So, Ms. Woods Jefferson, do you have an answer? I do not. I have to defer to Jason Cameras on that one, sir. That was on the last day and the first day. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm still trying to get confirmation. I'm waiting for Jason's assistant actually to get back to me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I think I already asked this. If involuntary re retirement is available as an early retirement under the bill, Am I correct that these teachers will still be able to take advantage of option one, which is the buyout, uh, buyout, and option two, which is the supplemental health benefits? You mean uh, concurrently? Yeah. So to take the buyout and get then the involuntary retirement yeah, benefit? Yeah, I'm not quite understanding this, um, the question. Is there any way that a teacher could, uh, under under the reading of this bill, um, get the buyout and take the uh, early retirement? I shouldn't say early retirement, the involuntary retirement? Um, I think we'd have to th think about that one for a second. I don't believe so because the provisions of the buyout are separation from the system. In essence, you resign. If you have 20 or 25 years, you could get the uh, retirement, though. Um, I, I would need to. I would need to think about that for a second. How do you read that? I 
never be it as an or, mm -hmm. not an and. Yeah, you get to choose one. Yeah. So you'll think about that. Yeah, I think about it. My, my position off the top of my head is no, that it's two paths, not concurrent paths. But again, well, let me... I don't think it's directly germane to the bill. It may not even be indirectly germane to the bill, but um, the involuntarily separated, except for misconduct or delinquency, is available to any teacher with 20 or 25 years of service. And the supplemental unemployment benefits are not, um, I'm going to say, mutually exclusive. And the buyout's not mutually exclusive. So the supplemental employment benefits, the VBA, if that's what you're referring yes. to, that is, I would argue, most definitely exclusive of the buyout. In because that it, it's, it's explicitly in, replace, in, in place of option two. Correct. And those are, by definition, ex exclusive of one another. Yes. Um, as for the taking the buyout and being eligible for involuntary retirement benefit, assuming you have the years of service, um, again, I would need to reflect a little bit more on that. Because you don't have to offer the buyout. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, think about it. Okay. Because I don't think it, it's... The, the bill doesn't depend on that. Yeah. Yeah. Depends on the language in the contract, yeah. I would think. I think I asked you this already. How many teachers do you anticipate will be accessed to both at the end of the current school year and next school year as a result of school consolidation? I think you already said it could be like five to 800, did you I say? I said five to 600, just to clarify, that is a total accessing estimate, which is inclusive of not only consolidation, but our normal accessing process. Yeah. I think the consolidation number is closer to two to three hundred. Well, what adds to that? Then what do you mean by the normal accessing process? So imagine school A that receives a declining budget for next year. It could mean an excess. Correct. Or school A is changing its academic program. It had Spanish and French last year. This coming year it will only have Spanish. The French teachers are accessed. So there are multiple mechanisms. Largely, it's budget-driven, but it can also be a change in academic program, um, in addition to closings, consolidations, restructurings that generate the excess. So um, about two to three hundred from consolidation, and another, because I think you said five hundred to six hundred, five hundred to eight hundred, five hundred to six hundred. Two to three hundred consolidation. Two to three hundred non-consolidation. I think it's three to four hundred. Maybe not. I'm not good at math. Any other questions? Um, did you, all of you at the table, look at this uh, draft print that we have? It's a little bit different than the language that the uh, teachers union had. I have not seen it. Okay, we will give you a copy. It looks like this. Okay as opposed to this. No. Looks like this as opposed to this. Yes, I have it now. Okay. So if you would just look at that and uh, get back to us um, today or Monday. Uh, basically, it takes the one sentence that uh, Mr. Saunders referred to, and uh, it broke it down more along our legislative drafting format. Uh, but substantively, I believe it's the same. Yes, from my cursory read now, it um, seems perfectly fine. Okay, but I will, more we will follow up. Yes, absolutely. Um, we can also follow up with you on the question about the last day of school and the first day for 1314. Unfortunately, I'm not getting a quick answer, but we can give that to you. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't think I have any other questions for you. Um, if there's anything else you wish to add, let us know. And then, uh, yes, please do look uh, more carefully at the legislative language. Absolutely.
Thank you. Thank you. Each of you. I believe this concludes uh, the testimony. Um, I appreciate that everybody who's testified is stuck around to hear all the discussion. Again, um, we're looking to mark this up on Tuesday, so uh, comments, additional comments, please get it to us by uh, close of business on Monday. The record will be open longer. First reading will be May 7th. The time is now uh, 2.30 in the afternoon, and this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>